From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The U.S. Supreme Court reaffirms the right of state courts to review congressional maps and state election law, though does so in a way that could create even more election chaos. Meanwhile, electric truck maker Lordstown Motors declares bankruptcy on Tuesday, the latest sign that Washington's EB industrial policy is unraveling. Welcome to Potomac Watch. I'm Kim Strassel, joined today by my fabulous colleagues, Alicia Finley and Kate Batchelder Odell. The Supreme Court issued its decision in Moore v. Harper on Tuesday. And just a little background here. Now, over the past decade, state Supreme Courts have become new political battlegrounds with both sides in the political fight pouring money into state Supreme Court elections, especially in swing states, with the goal of gaining a majority on those courts that will then intervene in partisan fights over redistricting maps or election laws, trying to get those courts to give one side or another a political advantage. I mean, those courts have been doing so. We saw it, obviously, with a lot of the interventions during the pandemic. We saw it following the 2020 census with big battles over congressional redistricting maps, places like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Ohio. So it was inevitable that the high court was going to be asked at some point to weigh in on the outer limits of this. And the case it chose to look at came out of North Carolina, where a left-leaning majority of that court threw out the legislature's redistricting plan a few years ago, saying it was a partisan gerrymander that was banned by the state constitution. And one reason the case was problematic is that the majority threw out the map on a very, very sweeping basis, arguing that it had an obligation as a court to protect, quote, free elections, which basically opened up the court to throw out any map or any election law on that basis. It then imposed its own map, overriding the GOP legislature, and that legislature then sued. Alicia, can you tell us what North Carolina Republican lawmakers argued in bringing this case and what the Supreme Court actually held yesterday? The Republican lawmakers basically argued that Uh, The legislature has exclusive responsibility over elections and setting election laws and drawing the maps for elections under the Constitution's Elections Clause, which requires the legislature of each state to prescribe the times, places, and manner of federal elections. So, again, this includes the maps that are redrawn every decade, as well as voter ID requirements, setting whether early voting restrictions, as well as mail-in ballot requirements. Now, now, the Republican lawmakers basically argued that the state Supreme Court, you know, overstepped its bounds and that it has really no jurisdiction to review its maps or any other laws passed by the legislature under this elections clause. Now, the Supreme Court ultimately rejected that argument. It's actually just a step back. It's known as the theory of the independent legislature. And some uh, listeners may have heard about that at the time that it was argued last fall. Now, the Supreme Court ultimately rejected this reading, but it was kind of a wishy-washy opinion that didn't really settle much. It basically said that, well, yes, state courts do have a jurisdiction to review state legislative maps and other laws passed by legislatures, and it cited a 1932 opinion in uh, Preston, uh, known as Smiley, which upheld a governor's ability to veto state legislatures redistricting maps. But it also said that, well, the federal courts, and in particularly the U.S. Supreme Court, can also review view the state Supreme Court's decisions if they are so rogue or errant and violate federal law. So this really actually didn't settle much. It kind of takes us back to the status quo. Then we can discuss a little more. I think we're going to continue to see more litigation in both the state courts and, and federal courts as a result. Yeah, let me drill down into that just a little bit. So, you know, the left is hailing this as some huge victory, saying, The majority rejected that independent state legislature theory that Alicia just mentioned. And you can have certain media outlets arguing in the run up to this case. And I quote the New York Times here that such a law would, quote, give state lawmakers nearly unchecked power over federal elections, end quote. But it strikes me that what the court did here is even more of a muddle. Okay, fine. It's okay to say that state judiciaries do have some ability to review maps and election laws, but it really didn't give any outward limits. And I'll quote the chief justice here who wrote the opinion, John Roberts. He said, 
quote, the questions presented in this area are complex and context specific. We hold only that state courts may not transgress the ordinary bounds of judicial review, end quote. Okay, so what's the ordinary bounds of judicial review, Kate? This is something that Justice Kavanaugh, who did go along with majority, had a concurrence talking about the need for a limit and the dissenters, Justices Thomas and Gorsuch and Alito, really found fault with. I mean, didn't they really just create even even more of a muddle here and invite more cases? Well, that is what Thomas predicted. And I think that prediction will be borne out. At a really fundamental level, I do think we should pause to appreciate how untethered the coverage of this case was from the underlying facts. It was basically being treated as a threat to democracy when we're discussing whether the legislature is the most appropriate place, the people's elected representatives, to make these decisions or whether they are better suited to the courts. So at a very broad level, I think the stakes of this case were just misrepresented fundamentally. I'd also add that I think one important point here would be that we hear a lot these days about the court being a right-wing court, but the court is not ideologically monolithic by any sense, even on, among the originalist justices. So you see here a real difference of opinion on an important legal matter. On the question of the muddle, I think what the court's history suggests is that any time the court tries to make one of these hashes, it doesn't work. We're currently waiting for a decision on the Harvard case involving racial quotas. And the history there, you know, for instance, the Fisher case several years ago, we've had justices like Justice Kennedy try to invent some standards where you can use racial quotas in college admissions. And then these cases end up back at the court. So I think that is a fair blueprint here to expect that the court has granted some amorphous deference here that will certainly be interpreted broadly and will invite the court just back into this morass in the first place. Yeah, it does seem as though it's creating more headaches for itself because the way I kind of read this ruling and the chief justice's use of the words ordinary bounds is it's it's sort of like the courts or the definition of pornography will know it when we see it. And in the broadest, broadest sense, what this decision does is keep the U.S. Supreme Court as the final arbiter of all of these things. So in essence, it's just inviting more of these controversies to come land at its feet. Alicia, Kind of an interesting history since this case was filed. In last year's midterms, the North Carolina court changed its makeup again. It gained some more conservative justices, which have since overruled that prior decision that was the subject of this Supreme Court lawsuit. And a lot of people were urging the court as a result, the high court, to simply declare this moot and not issue a ruling here. The U.S. government itself urged that. And this was something that Justice Clarence Thomas picked up, this thread in his dissent. He said that the court was breaking with its own precedent on mootness. He said, and I quote him, the question is indisputably moot, and today's majority opinion is plainly advisory, he wrote. I don't know if that's certainly the way it's going to be taken, but what's your view on whether or not the court erred in even going ahead with this case and issuing a ruling? You know, I think the courts, the way that they looked at it, or the majority already looked at it was, well, this question needs to be decided sooner or rather than later. And of course, as I mentioned, I don't think this really settles anything, but there was an impetus for call in 2020 when the Pennsylvania Supreme Court essentially moved the mail-in ballot deadline by a few days for this issue to be settled. And actually, Justice Alito wrote an opinion urging the court to take up that case, which it ultimately didn't decline to. And so I think there was even an appetite among conservatives back then to resolve these issues, and especially with an election coming up in 2024, they wanted to address this idea of the independent legislatures and and maybe actually put some more bounds on state courts. That is not ultimately what they decided to do. So in in a way, it was kind of (laughs) counterproductive. But to some extent, I think the the, the question of mootness is somewhat moot because the court was eventually going to have to take up this issue. I think there are arguments on both sides on the mootness 
point. But ultimately, I think the problem is that the court didn't end up settling anything. And to the extent that Justice Thomas suggested it was an advisory opinion, well, that's just it. It didn't didn't really actually set any new case law or precedent. It was just saying, well, rejected the independent legislature theory, which it had already rejected in the past, but didn't really go any further. Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence provided a little more guideline in that he you know, suggested taking up the Justice Rehnquist standard in Bush v. Gore. But again, that didn't make up the controlling opinion in the case. So it was just a concurrence. So again, we're back at the same stand. Yep, which means many more fun court cases to come. <laughs> 